You good? You're good. All right. <laughs> All right, what's up, everybody? Podcast. Come on in. Um, so, uh, chapter seven, and obviously, um, same concept as previous days. Let us know the page number you're on, and I, I felt very similar to yesterday. Like I feel like I underlined everything in this chapter. It was it was so good for me. Um, so same concept. Let us know where you're at, and we'll try to follow along with you, and try not to talk over each other because of the mics. And sorry for those of you who have tried to watch the past few days. We're having some audio issues, but hopefully. It's YouTube's fault, not our fault, so hopefully um, we get it all fixed and set up and ready for you. But it's been great, and it's always uh, um, a, a blast being able to do this together as a family, and excited that you guys get to watch our interactions. So, um, Chapter 7, The Door to More. It's not the name of it, but I thought I'd throw a shout-out to <laughs> Tommy Stewart, The Door to More. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, who wants to start us out? I'll go first. There was a lot in this chapter, but I love... Because um, you didn't go first yesterday. Because you I left because the baby was fussy. Yeah, I know. And then you, you guys were laughing really loud, and I was like, he's sleeping over there. I really hope he goes to sleep. So, we're going to go quickly so that if I have to know an exit, then I can Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I love the whole, like, introduction to the, the whole concept of the signs and, like, what he means by signs. Like, he's very clear on, like, page 97 is where the signs section kind of starts, but it's, like, throughout the whole chapter. But he talks about, you know, it's not, like, horoscopes, tarot cards, or palm reading, but it's, we have to, the very bottom of page 97, it says, but we must learn to read signs the way we read scripture with the Holy Spirit's help. Make no mistake about it. And then on 98, God speaks through circumstances. Scripture is our best, that's our direct evidence, but circumstantial evidence counts, too. And I love this next section. The language of doors requires the gift of discernment, which goes beyond institute, um, intuition, sorry, based on accumulated experience that goes beyond contextual intelligence to emotional intelligence. Discernment is the ability to appraise a situation with supernatural insight. It's prophetic perception that sees past problems and envisions possibilities. Simply put, it's picking up what God is throwing down. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so good. It was a good introduction to what what he means by the language of doors and what signs really mean. Because sometimes, you know, people are like, I'm praying for a sign, but really it goes along with scripture. Scripture is the direct evidence but then also we have the circumstantial evidence too, like looking for God in everything, not just reading scripture, but what happens in life. But being able to have the discernment to know which is him speaking and which is not. I just like that part. Yeah, the praying for signs, people, you need to read this chapter. <laughs> yes. I, I love even like whenever he's talking about um, <coughs> moving to Washington and he didn't get a sign until he made the decision to move. Yeah. Yeah. Then he got the postcard yeah. in the mail. You know, it's like mm -hmm. sometimes we're waiting for a sign and God's like, Eh, you move first. You, you show me that you're going to take this step of faith first, and then I'll give you a sign. Um, same portion of Scripture, the very next uh, few sentences. Um, let me remind you that we don't interpret Scripture via signs. We interpret signs via Scripture. Generally speaking, God uses signs to confirm His Word and His will. I love it. We... we I say it this way in the Pentecostal um, ways that I was raised. We cannot allow experience to determine what Scripture says. We have to allow Scripture to determine experience. So, even in signs here, good thought for everybody who's, well, God gave me this sign, so it neg negates this Scripture. No, absolutely not. That is so not okay. Somebody else. I love the part where it just says, uh, you know, uh, I think I'm on page, what is it, um, 99 or so. Uh, discerning the will of God is about so much more than doing his will. Discerning his will is about knowing his heart. And that happens only when you get close enough to hear him whisper. And I think that in a lot of Christian circles, it's all about, oh, what's the will of God? What's the calling on my life? And, and you're seeking the, the will of God. But then when you get close enough to know his heart, uh, those things become evident. Did anybody find that? Page 100. Sorry. Top of 100. Tony's reading electronically, so he doesn't know what page we're on. <laughs> I can get it close. It tells me close. <laughs> but, yeah, just, 
just knowing his heart and, and finding the heart of God um, rather than seeking just the will and, and the plan as, as though you're doing a checklist. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Oh, and then right after that, I love the, uh, the juice box test that he talks about, mm-hmm. about um, uh, how they, they called it, I can't pronounce that word, which means wild goose. Yeah, the goosebumps test isn't great. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, like, like, don't say, "Oh, I got goosebumps," so that's the Holy Ghost. Um, Which used to be the that was the that was it. Yeah, that was the test. We used to call them Holy Ghost goosebumps. Absolutely. Um, so, as I understand what he's saying here, that there should be a a physical <laughs> it's such a bad physical tingle to. Mm-hmm. To the plans of God for your life. Tingle or tinkle? <laughs> it shouldn't make you tinkle. It should, <laughs> it should be a tingle, a spiritual tingle to um, to God's plan for your life. But don't think every time you get goosebumps because it's cold that that's the Holy Ghost, Holy Holy Spirit moving on you. So don't. So take take what he's saying there. Yes, absolutely. But also understand, you know. To me, there's a there's a feeling when God reveals something to you or speaks to you, and and, and you may get that feeling at other places and at other times. But there's a oh, yeah. that was there was something something in my spirit there for sure. And hard, think, hard to describe. And I think he does a good job of explaining that. Hey, this is just the first test. You know, there are five tests that he goes through personally. And, and also he talks about taking out the garbage and doing the dishes. You don't do those because you get a tingle. You do those because they have to be done. And I think that's important to know as well because oftentimes in emotional circles, it becomes I only want to do this because of the tingle that I feel rather than I, I know I have to do the dishes because it makes my wife happy. And so I'm going to do the dishes to make my wife happy the same way I'm going to do certain things for the Lord to make him happy without him having to tell me or make me feel good about it. When I, like I read the, sorry, go ahead. I was say when I read that part, I actually went back to the beginning of the signs part on page 97. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a simple sentence, but it says ignoring signs is ignoring the God who speaks through them. And then it lists, you know, examples of Noah and Joseph and Moses. Like, Yes, you know, ha- the signs have to line up with Scripture, Scripture, and then the confirmation of the signs. Um, but when it talked about, you know, the goosebump test, um, I was like, ah, I thought the same thing. I was like, ah, you know, it could work, but maybe it's, you know, not, you know, tell all. And he, he tells, he says that. Yeah. Um, but to not ignore what God is speaking um, through other people or, you know, around us or in Scripture. And so it's just a good reminder, like, to not ignore it. And know i love the very solid examples of this was a sign for these people and don't want to miss it but you don't want to like read into it without it having confirmation of scripture yeah i would say having goosebumps and no peace and wise counsel saying not doing that but standing on the fact that you had goosebumps when you felt that thing you should probably listen to your peace and your wise counsel so that's kind of the concept we're talking about with goosebumps. Johnny, you were about to say something. Uh, just at the beginning, the, the kind of introduction they talked about with the people, it was kind of the, it didn't really settle in until we got to the end of 96. And he said, um, it was it was his a fascinating footnote, that's what he said it was. Uh, the Mokin don't know how old they are because their concept of time is very different from ours. They don't have a word for when, they don't have a word for hello or goodbye. And although we might view that as a logistical liability, it's more than mere coincidence that the Mokin don't have a word for worry either. And so I kind of, it wasn't probably part of what he meant to say, like when he was talking about the tsunami killed more than 224,000 people, but it almost made me think about like how much worry can crush us. And while we're, you know, going through life and we're not able to see the things that maybe that God wants us to see, so I was kind of like, man, what's the stuff that's kind of taking my eyes off of what I really need to be focused on? So. Dang, I've been speaking to you through this book, ain't he? <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. I thought that story uh, with the Mokins was interesting 
how much the way the outside world looks at God speaking to a pastor to speak to a congregation as just just nonsense, you know? And it's the same way, like, there were all these people who had the same signs, had the same message. Yeah. That they could have avoided the tsunami if they only knew and, and were receptive to the signs. And so it's people that don't, who have never heard God speak, who think, oh, that's nonsense. Yeah. And yet, I mean, these people escaped because they were mm-hmm. cognizant of those signs. Clint, what you got? Um... God actually put a sign in this book, in this <laughs> chapter, for me. Um, the, you know, when he's talking about uh, Balaam's donkey talking to him and everything, uh, page uh, 110. Um, and uh, you know, it says uh, n- near the bottom, it says, The angel who stops Balaam in his tracks says, I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The word reckless comes from the Hebrew word yarat which is the age of the equivalent for reckless driving. And it goes on to say, it's driving 30 miles per hour over the speed limit around S-curves on a Pacific Coast Highway in California. Don't be surprised if God slows you down. Don't be surprised if God gets in the way. Why? Because he loves you too much to let you go headlong into trouble. And when I was in my late teens and early 20s, I my physical address was Pacific Coast Highway, and I drove like that on Pacific Coast Highway and Malibu Canyon all the time. We, we would literally have races on Malibu Canyon to see who could drive the 11 miles the fastest, and, um, and I feel like my, my Christian walk has been that way for almost all of my life. It's just been reckless, you know, and it's only just been recently that um, that I've started to slow down and and understand what God has for me and everything. But through all of my life, I, I being reckless, God has been in the way, yeah. and I'm so thankful for that. Yeah. Hey Amen. That's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> so good. Oh, um, I'll go. Okay. That that part uh, spoke to me as well. That's one of the main parts. And then the last two pages, um, 113 and 114, the bottom where it talks about us um, reading the Bible the wrong way with low expectations. Um, And he says, I read it with this core conviction. If we do what they did in the Bible, God will do what he did. Why? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'll take it one step further. We'll do even greater things. Do we need to hear his voice any less? Do we need fewer miracles? Do we need fewer gifts, fewer signs, fewer open doors and closed doors? The answer is no, 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 and no. May God sanctify our expectations so they're on par with Scripture. May we pray with the same kind of expectancy that Billy Graham did when he visited Epworth Rectory, and I think I said that right. Lord, do it again. And then the last part, one of the two things, uh, one of two things happens over time. Either your theology will conform to your reality and your expectations will get smaller and smaller until you can hardly believe God for anything, or your reality will conform to your theology and your expectations will get bigger and bigger until you can believe God for absolutely everything. Yeah. So much. Let me, let's just break that down into two different (laughs) concepts, okay? First off, how do you read the Bible? You know, he talks about do you read it like a history book or do you read it like it's living and active? Yeah. Do you read it as if God is finished with what he's doing or do you believe that God is wanting to do it again and again and again? Um, so let's start there. How, how do you read the Bible determines your perspective of who God is. So when you're reading the Bible and you're seeing things in the Bible as and people have, have even, people who go to this church even believe this differently than I do. But when you read the stories of David fighting a giant, and you read it as David is, this small little boy is able to kill a giant, so God is still able to do these things inside of my life, it gives you encouragement and strength to, to face things in your life. If you read David killed a giant 
as historical evidence of, you know, God's grace and mercy through the children of Israel, then you read it as a perspective of, wow, God was good in that moment. Um, It's two completely different aspects of who God is. God was good versus God is still all-powerful and able to accomplish supernatural things. Two completely different versions of God, although it's the same God. It's literally the same God, two completely different versions of who God is. And so I would just encourage those of you watching this, like, what what you read, um, how you read the Bible will dictate, not that God changes, your perspective of who God is changes. So how you read the Bible will determine your perspective of God. When you read stories in the Bible and you say, can God do this today? Is, is he still alive and well? Is he still able to do, is he still able to stop, make the sun stand still? Can God still do that today? Or is that just a cool story that has grown in legend through the years and it really didn't happen that way and it really, it's two completely different versions of God. So you got to determine Hopefully, the God you serve is the God that's still doing that. But you got to determine, those of you watching this, you got to determine what version of God you're going to serve. Um, and the version of God of, wow, that's a really cool story, is a version of God where you see fewer miracles and fewer gifts and fewer signs and fewer open doors, fewer interaction of him with his people. The God of, that's him, that's what he's doing, he can still do that today, creates a completely different interaction of him in your everyday life. So read scripture with expectation would be my encouragement to those of you watching. Read scripture with expectation that God is still moving. And then the end of this chapter, I just underlined it all and said, wow. Literally, this is what I wrote, wow. Like, there's power of life and death in the tongue. I, I, I wish my wife was here for this one. I wish I'm going to send this, this, this to her. She may not understand it fully, but I would love to talk through this with people. Um, your theology will conform to your reality. Your expectations get smaller and smaller until you hardly believe that God can do anything. Or your reality will conform. And your expectations get bigger and bigger until you believe God can do absolutely everything. It's the way you speak about it. It's the way you. It's it's the way God is. God is moving over there. God can do that. God could do that. God can. No, no. What is? God is moving. God is doing. God is able. This is who He is. And so, um, your your expectation, your reality, your theology, all of those are tied together. So make sure you understand as you're talking about him, who he is, what he what what he's able to do. You know, when when you're talking about um, JD three and and SMA and doctor calling you and saying this is happening, you no, know, we're, we're not gonna. We, we understand the report. We understand what the doctor's saying, but we're also understanding that our theology is gonna match the reality because of our expectation of what God can do because of our theology, right? And so so it, it, it becomes, God, I need you in the moment. And I'm, I'm, I've built my life around an understanding of you're still able to do this. My theology is you're still able to do this. So then my expectations become through the roof of God's able to do incredible supernatural things. And so I just encourage those of you watching this, spending time here today, like, don't minimize God can God can do great things through me. Yes, he can. You know why God can do great things through me? Because I believe that God can do great things through me. You know why God can do great things through you? Because you believe God can do great things through you. I am insignificant. I am so insecure. I oftentimes say to myself, why in the world is God using me? Like, oftentimes say that to myself. And then I often think, oh, why not? He used the donkeys. <laughs> like, 
certainly he can use, if God used a donkey, certainly he can use Jamie Barclay. Right? That's the God I serve. And so my expectation is there's still way more incredible things that God has in store for me because I believe God used the donkey, which then changes my reality based on my expectation of what my theology is, right? So this is so beautiful, so so impactful to, to me personally. But I just want to encourage all of you, especially some of you around this table that think I'm so insignificant, I'm so insecure, I can't, I can't lead a kids' ministry that will one day be X, Y, Z. I can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not capable of doing that. Of course you're not. Of course you're not. Of course you can't lead an outreach program that's going to do everything that we're going to do through outreach in the future. Of course you're not. Of course you're not capable of doing that. Right? But if God can use a donkey, then certainly he can use your willingness, your humble heart to say, okay, Let's, let's see what God can do through me. I have an expectation that although I'm not capable, I'm not able, I have an expectation that God can do supernatural things. Anyways, just my thoughts. I, I really wanted to spend some time there to encourage everybody watching this because so often we speak, we speak death over what God has done. Over, not over what he's done, over what he can do in our life. We speak death. I know God heals cancer. I saw him do it in Jess Putnam. But I also saw him not heal cancer in my dad. And so now I speak death over, I don't know what God's going to do for this person because I, no, 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 no. I, I watched him do it. I've seen you do it. Even though you didn't do it in this situation, I don't understand why you didn't do it in this situation. But that doesn't, that doesn't hinder my faith and my ability to know that this is who you are. And my expectation is that every time I pray for it, you're going to heal it because that's the God you are. Weird how we default. <laughs> We default to he won't do it rather than he will do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, all of that, I think, just ties into a mindset of of what do we believe? Do we be- If we went to go see a comedian recently, and if I saw a clip of that comedian and somebody says, how is he? I'm going to say, oh, he's funny. He is funny. I would never say he was funny unless unless what? Unless he was dead. And I think that's what we, we say with God so many times is, you know, instead of we read the Bible, oh, he is good. Look what he is doing. We say, oh, he was good. And so that gives a mindset of he's dead. He's not doing it anymore. But he's still alive, just like Clint is is awesome. Not he was awesome because he's still alive. He's still moving. And I just think it's a mindset of death that we have where we default to he won't do it. Or he's moved away. Or he's yeah. distant. Yeah. Or he's no longer engaged in what we're doing here. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. 100%. I think that's where our... Inferiority, inferiority comes in and how our smallness, you know, we just, we can't think of how big God is and how much he can do. You know, we, we look at things like cancer, you know, and what's, what's the statistic? One in every three, you'll get cancer or whatever it is. And we just go, oh man, that's, I mean, when we think about it from, from our own perspective, it's like, that's exhausting to <laughs> heal, 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 you know, but for God, it's nothing, nothing at all, you know, and um, and we just don't we just don't think like that. God literally protected the shoes of the children of Israel as yeah. they're wandering <laughs> around the desert. Their shoes didn't wear out. He protected millions of pairs of shoes so that they wouldn't wear out. That's the that's how much he cares. So, to to think that what he's done for one, he isn't able or won't do for others is just not consistent with who he is in the Bible. That's not who he is. You know, Tony's favorite scripture. I don't know if it still is. Used to be his favorite scripture is at the book of John. And and what does it say? Quote it because I always misquote. Um, oh Lord, um, something to the effect of it. This, be the, the, this is like who tests all these things. Uh, basically saying, uh, right after that it says, uh, these things that we've recorded, uh, he did, but he did so many other things that if they were all written down, not even the books, uh, not even the world itself could contain the books that should be written. Yeah, look it up real quick, Johnny, and, and read it. Last verse of John. It's literally the last verse of John. And John is the one gospel that was written 
outside of the other three, to say, let me remind y'all who he was. I've read what y'all wrote, but now let me remind you of actually who he was. And then he gets to the very end of his gospel and says this. Um, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Yeah. So, like, if, like to think that he did, well, yeah, he did these miracles, but Jesus' life was so long. And the fact that he did... These miracles, you know, there were a lot of days where he didn't do miracles. What? John said the whole world couldn't hold all of the books if it were written about what Jesus did. So he is plenty capable of doing as many amazing things as you need him to do. That's who he is. And to think that he did all of that in basically three years. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. Imagine what he could do in 10. Samantha, what do you got? Let's change subjects. Uh, I like the sleeper effect um, portion on 111 and 112. Um, on 112 where it says, um, he says, at the risk of offending someone, I'll admit I'm not a huge fan of billboard evangelism. I think it's far more effective to share our faith in the context of friendship. But let's be humble enough to admit that God can speak through anyone, through anything. Far be it from me to tell God how to do his job. After all, he speaks through donkeys, and he still uses tools like you and me. And just the, just like sometimes we, I feel like we dismiss little things or like anything that I speak to, out to someone that's a truth, um, that's truth found in scripture or, or who God is or his character. And it, I, it could just be a passing statement, but that could be the seed that's planted, and then God awakens that in them years down the road. It, it was just a really cool concept to go. You know, nothing I say or nothing that I do is, you know, goes void. You know, it's it's all for him. And so that, I, I don't know, I just really like that section. I love it. Cool, cool thought. It, it literally has happened to me this week. I wrote something on my prayer wall seven years ago, and I've used it four times this week. Yeah. It, it is it, it, in conversations, and I, I talked with Bryson Grizzle. I said, man, I don't, I don't even know why the Lord brought me back to this thing that he said to me seven years ago, and I don't know why, but here it is, and I've used it four times this week. It's like, oh, God, you spoke that seven years ago for me for this moment. I've never, I don't know that I've ever used it in the last seven years, and then I've used it four times this week. Yeah, super cool. So true. But you, Haley, got a lot highlighted over there. <laughs> um. when it's still um, talking about the different tests and stuff like that, kind of in the middle of the page after it's talking about the crazy test. Um, I don't know. I just really liked where it said, I don't know what God's will is for your life, and you certainly need to do your homework. But faith is the willingness to look foolish. Noah looked a little crazy building a boat. Sarah looked a little crazy shopping for maternity clothes at age 90. The wise men looked a little crazy following a star to Timbuktu. Peter looked a little crazy getting out of a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. If you aren't willing to look a little crazy, then you're crazy. And when it's the will of God, crazy turns into crazy often. Amen. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> mm. That's awesome. I love it. Thank you, Lord. Rachel, did you say something? I did. Oh, I'm just making sure. I like the. You did. I did. <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> Jack. Jack. You did. Uh, did I get everybody today? Johnny, did you say something? What was yours? It was about the milking people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I love the fleece, the thought process of the fleece, and, you know, not, not, not allowing that to be the have all end all. You know, a lot of people throw fleeces out, and you know, sometimes God doesn't answer in fleeces, and that's totally okay. That is a cool concept. I, I loved his take on that because that's one area of scripture that's always bothered me. It's like, man, Gideon's just totally taking advantage of God right now. But it's, it's like, no. He, he's saying he, he came to him in humility. He's like, God, I really, really want to know that you, that you actually mean this. I want to be sure before I take that. I've never looked at it that way. I've always just looked at it as like, dude, just do it. You know, why are you, why 
why are you testing God, you know, th this way? Um, so that was a, that was a good uh, I, paradigm shift. I yeah, I love the released from and called to concept. I think that's very important. Um, you know, I, I use a lot of a lot of people in this concept, but like I'm called to there, but I'm not yet released from this. And so I can't go here yet because I'm not yet released from this. Because if you go there too early, um, it could hurt a lot. And if you go there... Um, to er in both places, it hurt there because they're not ready for you, and you're not ready for them. But it also hurts here because you've, you know, closed the door that should have that you should have been in. So, anyways, I, I love that concept where um, to go to where God is sending you, He will also release you from where you've been. And a lot of times, pastors specifically get in a place where I don't know where I'm supposed to go, but I know I'm released from this season of my life. Um, you know, Joseph and I have talked about this through the years where Joseph was like, I know I feel, I feel like I am released. What do I do? Be faithful until God opens the next door. Like you just, you just stay there in faithfulness until God is, um, until he makes it abundantly clear what the next door is. Um, the will of God is like two pins. The first pin is called, um, is called to, the second pin is released from. At least from the current responsibility, not sure where you're called to, it can feel like a spiritual no man's land. Not sure what to do next. Until God, until God gives further instructions, I will suggest you do what you heard him say last. I love that. Yeah, I like the part under that at the beginning of the, the next section, the, the key of David. Yep. Um, you can't pray for open doors without accepting closed doors. After all, one usually leads to the other. In a sense, the closed door equates to release from and the open door. Um, Equals call to, and I like think about our life and you know closed doors that we've had, and um, how we ultimately had to be okay with those things, and and you know it's it's worked out that way. That holds true. That you know it's you got to get past those those closed doors and accept that there's something we're talking about small group um, that there's you got to get okay with those closed doors that only that God closes and. Open the open doors that he ultimately will open for you, and it will be perfect. So, amen. Anything else, Haley? Well, I mean, on 109, okay, go ahead, girl. Doors, <laughs> um, it says, We often think that when God closes a door, that that is his final answer. We put a period where God puts a comma, we think it's a no, but it's really a not yet. Mm -hmm. Story of so many of our lives, yeah. so many of our lives. I mean, honestly, if it were up to Tony and I, we would have been in this building 15 years ago. We couldn't have handled what God was doing here 15 years ago. And the church that was in here wouldn't have appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> a facility like this. <laughs> we looked. Yeah, we would have been in a facility like this 15 years ago. But we wouldn't be... If that were the, if God would have said yes, then we wouldn't have been a ministry today. If we would have been in this in a facility like this, um, fifteen years ago. So sometimes his no is a not yet. So true. So, anyways, thanks for some, some spending some time with us. spending some time with us. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we will see you. Night, yeah, tonight for service. Yes. Then tomorrow we'll see you tomorrow morning for um, book study again, and then we'll take the weekend off. So, uh, thank y'all. Keep going. You got this. Don't give up. Love y'all. Peace out. Let's go.